Welcome to the Notorious Scoundrels, a Star Wars Legion podcast bringing you the latest news, general perspective, and competitive discussion. Hello and welcome back to the Notorious Scoundrels podcast. I'm Kyle. I'm here with Jay and Tim. What's up, gentlemen? Yo, yo, yo. yo. Just another day at Disney World. You're looking very translucent today, Tim. Kind of blending <laughs> into that Hoth background a little mm-hmm. bit. Yeah. I like it. I, as the sun goes down, it'll darken out. All right. <laughs> oh, I keep forgetting you're like, I'm like, as the sun goes down. Yeah. Like, like it's, it's, dark it's 930 at night. Yeah. <laughs> what well, is he talking I'm about? Bo- oh, no. Oh. Oh, oh no, Tim. It's well, frozen. the p- cast must go on. Yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll see how long it gets him, takes him to get back here. Meanwhile, he's frozen with a, uh, I don't even know what that expression is. Smug. Um, I'm calling it smug. He came yeah. on this podcast <laughs> thinking he owns everything with his smug look and his backlit halo. <laughs> yep. No, there he is. Hey, he's back. All right. Of course, of course. Ah, and he's nope. gone. Nope. <laughs> no, no, he's actually gone. Oh, hey, he's gone. Oh, and he's back right. in. Hey, this might be the best intro to the podcast we've ever done. Literally, as we start, yep. yeah, <laughs> yeah, we were good. We we're yeah, good. We're for not the whole pre-show over. discussion. Yeah. And I had happening. a good, I had a good little clip. I'm both west and north of you, so. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Then, Canada is, in fact, both of those directions. Too bad it was three frozens you away from <laughs> when we were talking about it. <laughs> yeah, it kind of kills the joke a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, in my head, all of Canada is just like, kind of, directly north. Yeah, you know, so like it's dark here, it's dark in Canada, you know. But of course, Canada has a west coast, just like the U.S. has a west coast. So we have, yeah, we have, yeah. I mean, and the more north you go, the longer the summers are. The shorter yeah. the. I um, I had always heard about this from my friends who are Canadians, but I never really like really thought about it until I went to northern Quebec. Yet, yeah, man they legit are another country like completely separate from canada it is wild <laughs> well i mean yeah don't don't dwell too deep into the separate no places. i'm not i'm just saying from a <laughs> from a language barrier yes. standpoint okay I mean, it's uh, french, not poli- right? i'm not talking about political just <laughs> language barrier i do not know french uh i did not do well up there i'll tell you that much like <laughs> that was interesting and- and the chemical are staunchly French. They are yeah. not uh, in in France. You can speak English, and oh, they'll speak yeah. back. And Quebec, and also Quebecois is like a very like it's a unique dialect of French. Yeah, that is like even harder. To... You know what the <laughs> biggest my biggest savior was? I had that uh, Google Translate app on my phone, so I literally just held it out, talked into it, and then let it play to them, and then they talked into it, and it played back to me. Uh, that saved my butt and they all thought it was funny which was great because i was i was really upset <laughs> and so just not not i was upset at myself let me be clear because i didn't want to be that person you know what i mean like i i i grabbed a couple like french phrases so that i'd be okay because then i thought hey yeah i'll say a couple french things and then the boy oh you speak english all right let's talk english no no <laughs> and so i had a great time i met a bunch of amazing people had some great food but boy that was that was real rough and uh yeah <laughs> wow yeah i went to belgium once uh and they speak numerous different languages there but the primary yeah. one is is french so i actually attempted to learn french i've actually been there a handful of times and every time like i will i'd open in french thinking that i was going to like impress the person that i was talking to and then they would immediately give me like this exasperated look and just respond to me in English. And <laughs> that's what like, I was hoping for. Yeah. yeah. But no, that never happened. <laughs> they just kept going in French. <laughs> I was like, yeah. well, that was the extent of my, <laughs> my learning on this trip. So Google translate, here we go. <laughs> Which, Hey, I respect that man. You good for them. I just, that was, that yeah. was, a uh, whole new experience because I had been to Canada a lot at that point, but that was that was something else. So, anyways, 
<laughs> That's for our Canadian listeners. There you go. Which which uh, there's actually quite a quite a big Legion community in Canada. So yeah. gets undersold a bit sometimes, but uh, and Canada, I mean, yeah, go back apparently. Yeah, Canada, we appreciate you. Yeah. Yay. Um, anyway, we're not just talking about Canada today. We are going we to should. talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, such a great country it really is yeah. um everyone's so polite yeah um everyone's amazing yeah uh, uh i mean uh... <laughs> <laughs> certainly more so than here Let's just to be way. clear tim is from canada so he's allowed to say that <laughs> yeah um we're gonna talk about legion today we're we're gonna do a little bit of of, of hobby riffing uh, mm-hmm, i've been mm-hmm. i've been hobbying it up in advance of nova open um we're going to talk about blizzard force a little bit and uh because we haven't really like i mean we we did some sort of rapid reactions on the battle forces but we haven't really like done a deep dive into the various battle forces so uh, we're going to do blizzard force and um we're also going to talk about basically how to come up with a new list when you want to try something new what where do you start what do you do so uh before that though let's hit housekeeping Okay, so let's see. In housekeeping, um, as always, if you enjoy the blog, if you enjoy the podcast, join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash the fifth trooper. We actually just restarted the After Dark podcast after a few months hiatus, so that will ideally be going out weekly. So you can get all our extended thoughts. You can get all the thoughts I won't say on this podcast. Uh, You can get all my deep deep dark secrets and uh in-depth chicken and fox news on uh the after dark podcast which is on our patreon so you know if you join the patreon for even a dollar that helps us out and you get access to the after dark podcast in addition we're we're doing some of the print and play cards we're going to be giving away to a couple of our tiers and we've got some other really cool uh um giveaways that we're going to be doing here shortly and um once we uh, this is kind of another housekeeping announcement, but we're starting another podcast called The Fifth Tile here shortly that's going to be talking about all kinds of other uh, miniature games. And once we start that, we're actually going to have content that'll be Patreon exclusive as well for that, um, as, as well as a ton of other cool stuff. We're really, I'm really trying to, you guys have all been kind enough to sign up for Patreon and to join us and support us on there. And so I'm, I'm going to try really, really hard to like provide more content for you guys on the Patreon. That's Patreon exclusive. Um, you know, so, uh, so look forward to that. Um, you know, storm tide, if you want to play Legion in a different way, if you want to join our monthly narrative, um, and you actually, you don't even have to take my word for it. You could go on the Legion discord, um, and you can, go into the Stormtide channels, which are on the the main Legion Discord channel, and you can ask people on there what they think of Stormtide. You don't even have to take my word for it. It's a monthly narrative. You and your you and your partner get to to play through, read a really cool story, play some really unique uh, objective conditions and deployments. We give away a ton of like upgrade new upgrade cards. There's new tokens. There's 3D uh, models. We we've got all kinds of great stuff in there. So um, you know, if you want to start up Stormtide, you could start today, and and we'll get a box out to you when we ship out all the other boxes. So you could try that out. Uh, and then finally, you could check us out on our store uh, at thefifthtrooper.com. You know, we've got order tokens, we've got Legion products uh, that are at a consistent 10% off with the code uh, SWLegion. Um, and we usually have all the new releases when they come out and, and we take pre-orders for all that. And then something pretty cool uh, for those of you at home um if you see something legion related that's out of stock you can still order it and then we'll just order it so it'll go into a back order and then we'll get it in and we'll ship it out to you as soon as we get it in so don't ever worry about like the quantity you know because we can just we will order it for you and, and get it in um yeah i think overall housekeeping that's you know check out all our tools legion hq dot the fifth trooper.com legion stats dot the fifth trooper.com and then for those of you that want quick access to all the rules reference forum 
uh, links, all of that stuff for the, the rulings. This really helped us out at a tournament this weekend that I was at. Uh, you could go to legionquickguide.com and that's that's all that condensed in an alphabetical order. So, yeah. <laughs> you like that, Tim? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, is there any, you got any news for us today, Jay? I do let me get this up so the one of the one of the big news items uh i guess we could call it news is for those of you that don't know pax unplugged is a newer convention that's been going on about the last what five years i think um and it's out of uh philadelphia they do it at the pennsylvania convention center and uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is they are having a Legion tournament and uh, they just moved it up to 128 people for this for for this tournament. Um, it's being organized uh, by Nick Brobnar from Legion 99. I think he's TOing and he may be the, the head judge. Uh, so you know that the terrain's going to be really good. You know that it, I mean, Kyle, you've been to ACO and stuff that that Nick has run, and the terrain is always terrific. Best, and, best terrain at any tournament that I've yeah. been to, which is a pretty big sample size. So. You know, so uh, we're we're also sponsoring it along with the Legion Discord. Uh, and then here's the cool thing: we're we're going to be providing a ton of door prizes and and participation prizes and all these other prizes so right now pax doesn't have a world invite but what's going to be happening is top four players are going to receive flight vouchers to attend adepticon so in case there's uh events or if you have a world invite from another event like i like for instance i have a world invite from a store rpq um or prime or what it, whatever one it was at the time and uh i don't have a, a flight voucher like some of the like major tournament uh winners do and so what's happening is at pax the sponsors all got together and put together um flight vouchers for the top four and then as well they're going to be giving away uh, like a random raffle to two other people. So for a flight voucher, so up to six people who play at PAX, the top four, and then two additional random people will, will get flight vouchers to Adepticon. So if you, if you don't have a world's ticket or in case they have like a last chance qualifier at Adepticon, uh, or if you want to go to Adepticon for something else, you could get your flights uh, paid for if you if you attend uh, PAX, which is super cool. Um, yeah, and so I think it's going to be a great event. I think Nick is an amazing TO. He's got some great tables. Uh, that's he's from the Legion ninety nine podcast, which you guys can go check out him and uh, him and Mike. And uh, yeah. I think it's going to be a great event. Like I said, we're helping sponsor uh, tons of giveaways, tons of prizes, 128 players right in uh, Philadelphia at the P Pennsylvania Convention Center. So uh, I think you guys should sign up and be there. And and when is it there, Jay? Oh, hey, Tim, you know what? You want to know when it is, Tim? <laughs> sure. Tim, yeah. it's uh, December 2nd through December 4th. Of, oh, uh, right in the middle of the dance. Um, <laughs> all right uh yeah so how about we is that it for news jay i don't know i'm so off track now i, I have no <laughs> idea what i'm talking about um you know there's I, I got a bunch of um submissions for like international events that had happened and just wanted us to kind of like um talk about them but I, I gotta collect them all so so maybe we'll do that next week and we'll collect international them all event in. roundup yeah yeah just yeah sorry apologies international folks um we do care about you we know you're listening but you guys sent me a lot of stuff so i got i gotta like i gotta wrap it up into one nice package you know um all right well let's uh how about we open with hobby what what have you got? What did, tell me? What have you guys been working on? You've been working on anything? I mean, mostly the farm, but 
<laughs> miniatures. Tim, have you been working uh, on any miniatures? Painting? It's gonna be that kind of podcast, I, I, huh? I haven't haven't gotten any uh, <laughs> minis to play with done, but I've been doing. I'm I'm running a tournament in a month, so I'm putting together train. Okay. So uh, let's hear about that. Yep. Uh, my the one table that is sort of done ish is sort of like a crash starfighter Jakku esque type deal, but it's not desert. It's sort of like. Gra- like supposed to be on a grass mat or like a rocky mat and so it has some rocks and then a couple uh start crash star fighters just need to finish off i want i've realized that i don't want to do like another one or two crash star fighters because i've been sort of at our legion nights i've been stealing other pieces of train to put on this table to sort of fill it out but as i need to put together like probably three or four tables by myself for this tournament plus whatever else people are bringing i'm gonna Take the pieces of the train I usually put on the table, put them elsewhere. So I need to just replace those with a couple more crash star fighters. But those aren't too hard to do because I 3D print off a model from whatever kind. Con- like I've bought a couple, just a couple that I've found or sunk just regular SDLs into the print bed. So it's just sort of like half a thing sticking out of a thing. Like I, all the rocks I do, I just take sort of bolder STLs and stick them like halfway into the print bed so that they have a flat bottom and then they just sit flat. And then you also don't have any weird like corner peaking thing under the rock. Like they're all like, you don't have a weird situation Ooh. where LOS is like under something. It's always yeah. over something. Um, and then those, like I just airbrush, um, like I don't even take a paintbrush them at all. I just airbrush, put a little bit of contouring on them with a couple different colors done. And the starfighters just sort of basically paint like a model base coat. Put, and I try to like base coat, like sort of do primary colors with the airbrush. So I don't have to do as much of the brushwork. And then just fill it in with your paintbrush, do a little bit of dry brushing, and done. Nothing too complicated because I'm sort of kind of sort of donating all this to the store. So I want it to look decent, but also don't want to like put my heart and soul into it. <laughs> mm. Let me ask you a question. You mentioned you're talking a lot about printing, STL printing. Do you, is there a reason why you prefer printing an STL rock versus making it another way? Is it that you don't know how? Is it that you find it easier? Like what's what what's the reasoning for that? Because I have the printer and it'll work while I'm doing other things. Like the physical making of the rock. I, I, I mean, I could do it. It's not that hard to do, but it's something that I can just like let the printer do its thing while I do mm. other stuff. Yeah. Um. So, and then they, that like I can custom like I I've, I did a little bit of work to customize the rocks like I have like 20 different designs just saved in my computer and then I can print them off whenever I want to so if like and especially like if I wanted for instance like somebody asked me to like make a table quick well if I just print in gray plastic I just have gray rocks that I could make whip up like in two days like a whole table basically of just yeah. rocks wouldn't be ideal but um you could do that with like foam or whatever too but Mm -hmm. i just find the foam rocks have a very distinct shape that i don't particularly love like i think it works better for like larger flatter pieces um like our store has some really nice sort of foam rocks and stuff which is also another reason i like to print them because then it's more unique and then it also means it's easier for to like tell which is like mine which is theirs (laughs) so (laughs) <laughs> yeah, just just asking. I just, you know, it's yeah. funny because we have the printers, you know, for like all the miniatures that we do for Stormtide. And I always like in the back of my head go, oh, you know, we've got these printers here. I should just print some of this stuff off. But then in, for some reason, again, old man Jay here, uh, I just go to the old school way of doing things just because in my head it seems faster and I have more control over it. Do you know what I mean? And maybe I don't know if that's the correct <laughs> but it's just just how my brain ends up working you know i'm just like ah i'll just bang out a couple rocks and, and be done no i'm the same I mean, it, yeah it probably ends up being about the same amount of time but yeah. the printing is spread like i'll print off 20 rocks and put it like 10 minutes every like couple days into printing and then they'll be done in like a week whereas with yeah. making them yourself you'll sit down for two hours or an hour and do the same amount of work but that kind of block of time is that's sometimes fair. less easy to get yeah no that's fair for me 3d printing is still just like this nebulous thing <laughs> that is not something that my brain really wraps yeah. itself around um 
And so if, if I'm going to get 3D printed terrain, I'm going to basically get someone else to do it. <laughs> um, and if I'm going to make my own terrain, I'm going to just do the old fashioned method. Cause yeah, I, like, like you said, Jay, it's just, I don't know. It feels like learning how to do it with a 3D printer would, would be I'm, like, I'm sure that it would save me time in the long run, but it's kind of like before I got an airbrush where I was like, you know, oh, you know, like that's, that's too much to like, yeah, it's too much of a hurdle for my brain to overcome. I'm going to just keep doing it the way that I'm doing it. And then finally I got an airbrush and then I spent, you know, it sat on my shelf for probably more than a year. And then finally I spent the effort to actually like learn how to do it properly and spend some time with it. And then I was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> like how come I didn't do this before? Yeah, I think it would be the same way. I, you know, I, I use the 3D printers all the time, right? Like, and I have access to them, but it just for some with terrain specifically, um, I just have not like made that leap yet where I'm just like, I, I, I and I think maybe too, it's because I really, I really love like making terrain. Like, it's one of my favorite things about the hobby. And, and I'd like, the, the more hands-on like oh yeah you know i can sculpt this myself and you know which i uh, i don't know it's just old man yelling at cloud stuff you know <laughs> yeah i one one thing sort of for this conversation but also just in general like because i've i really enjoy cad computer augmented designer whatever the acronym stands for but something i've noticed in helping friends at school like learning cad and stuff if you're someone who played a lot of video games growing up like in like especially more modern video games that are 3d worlds learning to do the like virtual adjustments and stuff is way quicker whereas people who even like even if they're young but just didn't play a lot of video games growing up trying to get your mind wrapped around moving stuff around in a 3d environment digitally takes a lot more time mm. so if you're trying to decide whether like if you're even just thinking about getting a 3d printer in general if you've played a lot of video games it's pretty easy to learn and then if you haven't, it's still not that hard to learn, but it is sort of that the same sort of skill set to like do Minecraft <laughs> is like also the same kind of mindset to like just design anything on CAD. So, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. There you go. Hey, you know Minecraft? There are kids out there. Well, you could be a CAD designer. Get to it. Yeah, not, not even Minecraft specifically, but like even just like, can you turn a character around in a like 3d environment in a video game without yeah. like feeling sick if you can't cad is probably going to be a bit of a stretch for you <laughs> so, what are you trying anyway. to say tim what are you trying to say i am not saying anything about you i mm -hmm. I, there, I have i've been it's been very easy to tell who played a lot of video games as a kid as i try to teach people cat <laughs> Because I'll, I'll come across a friend and it's like, you did not play video games when you were a kid. Nope, I read. It's like, I could tell. <laughs> I could so tell you. you're a learned doctor versus. <laughs> <laughs> you're a book uh, nerd instead of a nerd nerd. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, did you work on anything, Jay? Hobby wise? Hobby wise. Um, yeah. You know, I just invested and I'm, I'm using that word around my wife, too, when I talk about this. I just invested in some speed paints. Uh, I got the mega set of the... I saw some... Okay, listen. They get me every time. They got me with contrast, too. So I saw a video, and I watched the whole video. And, I, and the, this guy was like, I'm going to show you the right way to use speed paints. And I was like, all right. And so I watched it and I'm like, those look much easier than contrast paints and they look better. And I'm, I'm all on board. I haven't opened the box to tell you guys whether or not it is, but um, I got a feeling it's going to be the same as contrast paints. And I've built it up in my head as if it's magic again. And I do this every time, every time I do this with everything. And I get so frustrated because in my head, technology, like, there's some new technology and I just want it to do all the magic without any of the work. Do you know what I mean? I just, you said this was magic. Do magic. And then it's the same with these speed paints and these contrast paints. You said it was magic. Do the magic paint. 
And meanwhile, I'm just slopping it on like an ape, you know, and it's just not going to work that way. And so I'm hoping uh, that goes well. But the other thing I've been thinking a lot about, too, and uh, started tinkering with is um, I, same. I want to make some more tables. Uh, you know, we we have a number here. I think I have about seven tables that we I try to bring to conventions and stuff because, as you guys know, there's always a need for tables. Um but I was just thinking a lot more about some other cool options for tables that I'd like to put together. And, you know, um, I won't go too deep, but some of these other games that we're looking to, to play and stuff for the other podcast um, are going to need a little bit different of terrain, but could also work for Legion. And so I'm trying to find that like middle ground where, okay, I could, this could like, one of the ones I want to do is a swamp, like a, like a swamp bayou type of area. I'm like, well, that could, that could be dig about it. Right. So like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do that in a way that works across multiple games so that, you know, nobody feels like, oh yeah, you were doing this for something else and you just threw it in for Legion, you know, where I could be like, ah, just put like half an X wing from like, uh, Legion terrain or something in there. <laughs> like now it's Dagobah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but yeah, I, yeah. So um, I've been really thinking a lot about uh, this swamp table. And one of my favorite things um, that I've, I, I, yeah, I think we all do this with like YouTube. We get into these like, you know, you, you just start going down these holes of like content, right? And and my big one right now is. Um, how to make them the most realistic miniature trees <laughs> for tabletop gaming. And like, I'm obsessed with it right now. And I've, I've, I must have watched like 40 videos already of just all these different, like, you know, oh, well, you could do it this way. Like, every way is different though. So, like, you're like, oh, I don't know what the best way is. <laughs> They're all different. Um, and so, yeah, I've been really, really going down a rabbit hole on, on miniature tree design. Um, you know, like, uh, for those of you who haven't, and you're looking to like, you know, um, great resources are like these guys that do like O gauge train scenery and stuff, right? Like, uh, O gauge is about the size of, for legion as well so and and marvel crisis protocol too it's it's all roughly around the same size so like you go, you get into like some of the o gauge stuff and you could you can turn out some scenery for 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 legion as well which is pretty cool well and trees i mean we just got done talking about 3d printing but trees are one of those things that's kind of hard to 3d print yeah and have it actually look good i mean you could potentially do some like alien trees that don't have actual leaves on them or something like that but Generally speaking, like if you want trees on your table, you're gonna have to make some trees. Um, now you could go to you could go to like a hobby store, you yeah, know, that sells like the you know ter terrain for and scenery for the trains and stuff like that, and you can buy some packs of cheap trees that look cheap. relatively fine, but also cheap, yeah. yeah. Um, or you can make your own trees, which is gonna be more involved, but they're also gonna look a lot better. Um, so that's one of those things I think where like scratch built terrain uh, kind of shines above 3D printed terrain is the, the stuff that's a little more dynamic and you know 3D printing is great for pieces that are square and blocky mm. um, but I think there's a danger of kind of overdoing that a little bit uh, I feel like that's a big thing for Legion specifically and there are a lot of tables you roll up to where it's just like a bunch of square blocky buildings and square blocky everything else um and it's like all right this whole table is 3d printed um which is great don't get me wrong uh it's much better than no yell at him kyle <laughs> tell him <laughs> i mean I, I grew up playing on a ping pong table with textbooks and shoes and uh yeah soda cans as terrain so um you know what we have now with 3d printing is great but it's definitely nice to see the occasional scratch built piece uh just because you can really tell the difference right um yeah yeah uh, i mean for trees specifically like endor trees you can 3d print right like redwoods yeah. anything smaller than that just but please don't work. do that because endor trees are the most useless piece of terrain on a legion table that i can think of um there's, if, there are a couple more useless ones but well but also like in moderation they're fine yeah but i i've seen tables where it's like the only train is like 20 redwoods yeah 
Okay. All right, Kyle, <laughs> you you saw my Endor table at Adepticon. It, what did you think of that? that? So that had the like, um, they're just the plastic, like they're they're probably like a couple, maybe a couple inches round. And it had like, this, uh, yeah, the bow staffs. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it was. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I tried to do that in a way where they they're more like the, they're connected to terrain that has like other lockers and stuff yeah. on it. And yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, I can't picture what you're specifically talking about, but yeah. I have played on I have played on at least one indoor table um, where they essentially did that. They didn't just take the trees and stick them everywhere. Yeah. Um, and maybe this was your table. So if maybe. it is, yeah, this it was. would be an endorsement of your table concept. I'm going to take credit up for it. Um, they they put the trees on other pieces of terrain that had like rocks yeah. or like there was one with like a bunker on it or like a sideways fallen tree. Okay, there you go. That was yeah, mine. Yeah. Been your table. Yeah, and then um, like I did one where there's like three trees and then I built like like a tent in between them where like a little camp yep. that they were camping or okay. I had, yep. I, I had like a T 47 that crashed into a tree. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the way to do it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to have other, <laughs> the, the trees by themselves, they look like they should be kind of line of sight blockers or be useful for cover, but because they're around, yeah. you know, they're, they're super easy to flank and get a line of sight around. And then if you, if you flank them, nothing behind them is in cover because it's just a round piece of right. terrain. Um, so you're either like, you know, if you're looking at them dead on, then you can potentially hide like one, maybe two models behind them or, you know, like um, sand people style go in a line <laughs> right behind them. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, like you, you change that angle even slightly and it ceases instantaneously to not only be a line of sight blocker, but also be any kind of useful cover. So using using like sideways pieces on the edges of those trees makes a big difference for making them actually useful for what their intended purpose i think is supposed to be yeah i think and, and also for well printing them or not like you can one when printing them you can like flip them on their side sink them into the bed and you have a mm. great like barricade basically but you can also like there's a lot of sdls that are like very skinny at the bottom we can also get ones whether you make them or print them if the roots like if you have big root systems that come out so they end up being like a big sort of central column, but then like basically barricades that stick out. Mm, they yeah. work a lot. They're a lot more functional than just a sort of a like if they're just a cylinder without any roots coming out. Then yeah, it's a huge problem. Yeah, I, you know, so for those of you at home, there's a there's this guy. His name's Jim Martin. He he does amazing, amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, train ships. He builds all kinds of stuff for the community, and. You know, he and I always have a conversation because his artistry is like through the roof. But some of his early tables were just and he knows this. They were unplayable. You couldn't play on them because everything was artistry first. No playability really thought about. And and he's been getting better and, and like working on his tables to make them more playable. But like, I really want to see us get to a point because I feel like and, and this is a gross exaggeration of <laughs> of of this but it's it, i feel like right now the focus is always about getting the train out fast so that we can get it done and i you know i would really love to start seeing that artistry be built into solid terrain that can and, and you know that's something i need to work on for myself personally too and you know that endor table is something i really tried to like do both like make it playable but also make it look beautiful and there's a real balancing act between the two because you know sometimes it's listen there's a ton of great tables out there but they feel like tables yeah and it's does that make uh, sense did uh, mm -hmm. that was kind of a weird statement at the end but you, you guys understood yeah we've kind of been like checking that initial box as a community which is just getting enough terrain to yeah play on you know in a way but, that's good but, which is um, like 80 percent of the challenge right right <laughs> so then what you're saying jay is it'd be nice if we could take the next step to make yeah. like actual art on the table that's also yeah. functional um, i i think we're getting there you know and i I, yeah. I i just i'd like to see that you know that's that's always my thing is because you'll see when they when uh, these companies do demos of their games whether it's legion or these other ones 
they always have this beautiful like they they commission beautiful pieces for these yeah. to, to get your eyes to go to the game and i'm just like man we could do this but we could do it and make it playable like we've just got to yep. find that balance and um i think i think we're gonna get there i think there's the next step and that's a draw for people at conventions you know yeah. the, the the tournaments are very visible um you know like people will walk by the tables and be like, wow, that's really cool. What game is this? You know? And uh, it's helpful in those situations to have terrain that is pretty. Yeah. You know, and iconic for star Wars. Also Um, there were quite a few, like, you know, people probably like Warhammer players and stuff at ACO because that that's not like an Adepticon style convention where it's um, you know, there's like vendors and stuff. That's like just a tournament. So there was a 40 K tournament. There was some other miniatures games and there was Legion and there were people walking by the tables at ACO being like, wow, this looks really cool. What, what game is this? Um, And it's, it's definitely, it'll be nice if we can get to an end state where we have a greater percentage of tables that are not only functional, but also very pretty for that purpose. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, when we did Northeast open, you know, Jim Martin had his Scarif table, uh mustafar table and something else hoth they're beautiful they are like art pieces like legitimate art pieces and you Mm -hmm. know that they're going to be rough to play on but you always put them up towards the corners where people are going to see them because they're going to draw people in you know and and people are going to see and go whoa what is this and you're like oh yeah this star wars legion and you know I think we could get there. I think we have a great community and we're always, you know, we're always hobby talking about miniatures and I'm glad, you know, we didn't plan this by the way, any, everyone at home, we just veered into, to tabletop, but I'm glad we're giving this some coverage because um, that's my challenge. I think to the community out there, it's like start building like art pieces that are functionally playable for Legion. I, th- I think that's our next step to really draw people into the game at your local store at you know the event you're holding or or whatever that's that's our next inevitable step to make this game great i think yep for sure when i'm thinking about what next pieces to train to make for my tables i always try to think about the story i'm trying to tell with the tables and like so like my like non-ip and or table with it (laughs) which has like a bunker at one end or whatever so i have a couple like towers with that are output like lookout posts and emplacement guns in a comms tower mm. but i always try to like when i'm putting barricades up and like sort of like little cover things i always have them sort of facing out away from the bunker it's like if you just look at the table it looks like oh this is the imperials they've set up their defensive fortifications around the bunker um instead of just like literally having the barricades all face each other at the middle um because it just makes it it just makes the table look more sort of a part of a jump bigger battle rather than just the table that you're playing on mm-hmm. yeah and that's something you can think of too in tables the design the barricades are a good ex- simple example but you can make a table balanced and still have it be thematic like in your example you could have all the barricades on one side and just use some barricade shaped object that's not a barricade like a fallen log as kind of like the barricades for the other side of the table so that you know both sides have access to that linear heavy cover but you don't just have a table with a bunch of barricades yeah. thrown in useful but thematically weird places um like the like i mean the, the sort of one end of the table has the bunker and like a couple of towers with like guns on them and the other side has like big sort of rock piles and stuff yep. that are like vaguely the same shape but they're not at all look the same so you get this idea of sort of like you know, get sort of rebels creeping out of the forest into the opening where the battle is going to take place Mm. and stuff. So it's funny. uh, I did not plan on plugging the blog today necessarily, but (laughs) the blog, the first blog article this week is actually an article (laughs) about scratch built terrain written by Cammy. So um, we didn't plan that either, but uh, that did work out. So go check out the blog. If you want some sort of basics on like just getting started with scratch built terrain. So the fifth trooper.com slash blog. Um, well, yep. I was going to talk about, I, I've painted Mr. Boba Fett. Oh, he is. Um, finally. Um, Got I feel like he's not, him, huh? yeah, it's, you can't really tell. Yeah. He does have green on <laughs> green screen. I don't know why I'm always trying to show off my green models when I, when I have know, a green screen. <laughs> um, 
but uh yeah i um i was surprised so i i basically like pulled up a picture of boba and the one that always comes up when you google it is him um you know it's the battle in return of the jedi at the sarlacc pit and he's got his blaster out and he's kind of you know it's it's essentially the pose that he's in but it's like the live action version of that mm. and i try I, I tried to look at him and be like all right how am i going to paint this i'm gonna look at this for inspiration and i was like shocked by how many different shades of the same color he was yeah um like there's like three different reds um there's at least three different greens because his his armor is one shade of green his cloak is a different shade of green and then his jetpack is actually like a third shade of green um so one of the things basically my happy idea for today is like when you have a situation like that where you have a model that has a bunch of different colors that are different shades of the same color like what do you do how do you paint that do you even try or do you just make them all the same green like what's your what's your process on that how much do we care (laughs) that's essentially the question right i mean i often try to like if it one of them is just like a little bit darker than the other i'll just like put an other an extra layer of wash over the one if they're flat plates it gets a little bit weirder what palettes are really good for this? Yep. Yeah. Um, I generally, depending on the green and, or let's say green, depending on the color, but you know, I'll, I'll usually take one and one, one green, one color green, usually a dark. And then I'll just try to lighten it up with some uh, like white or yellow or whatever, you know, whatever to like yep. get it to where I want it to be. Um, instead of trying to because at this point I literally have uh, I don't know a thousand paint things like I don't know I just pick a green I like and I'm like all right I'm just gonna lighten this or darken it up yeah <laughs> go from there that's that's how I'm working on this from now on you know but I I have noticed like um so with the uh uh the army painter like uh I got the war paints the air set the they they actually built in triads for for you like and so they have those in there but it, it's you know and and air paint you can use as on a brush too it, there's yep. nothing against that it's just a little thinner you know and so um but yeah i like that like they have triads built in but I, most of the time it's either through sheer laziness or because i know i won't be able to do it any other way i'll just darken and light it light, lighten it myself through the one color because that's going to get you the best results you know yeah and i definitely do that for uh units that i have to paint a lot of so if it's like a core unit or something like that where Mm. it's going to be repetitive and they have like multiple different like actually i started on my pikes here um so here's a pike not green not green yeah um so it actually shows up Uh, i actually thought about um doing like they're red in case you can't tell um I actually thought about doing like multiple different types of red because there's a lot of different contours and stuff on these pikes. And then I was like, no, (laughs) (laughs) we're going to do one color red and we're going to highlight it and call it a day. Um, But for, for units like that are like characters like Boba, I did end up doing, of course you can't see it because of the green screen, but I did end up doing different types of greens. Mm. Um, I have accumulated a lot of, (laughs) <laughs> the 40k armies i painted were uh i played were orcs and dark angels so i have accumulated a lot of different green paints yep. <laughs> over the years so i basically just leveraged that there's like a forest green there's like a turquoise green and there's like a normal green and that's basically what i did for those three different colors and then for the red i actually painted it brown and then i used the red wash on it to get more of like a burgundy burgundy kind of color um so yeah, but I wouldn't spend that kind of effort on something that wasn't a character. Um, yeah, and even then, it depends on the character, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, if it's like if it's like a generic or something, you're like, yeah, whatever. Uh, but this one was Boba Fett, and I've been looking forward to painting Boba, Boba Fett. Fett for a while. So Boba Fett, where it, <laughs> it actually occurs to me now that the background is like a Sarlacc pit. He could just yeah, yeah, buy <laughs> just straight in the Sarlacc pit there. Um. His most famous moment in Star Wars history, prior to getting his own show, anyway, was. Um, yes, it still is. Yeah, flying a new Sarlacc <laughs> pit. 
which apparently he survived. Um, All right. Oh, well, hold on. Hold, 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 hold. <laughs> I would say the Mandalorian episode where he's spanking stormtroopers okay. that's, that's was fair. a pretty good moment, too. I guess uh, I mean like an original like OG trilogy, yeah. you know, before before the Disney Plus series is series is series the series rise. <laughs> Siri, I don't know. Um, TV shows. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> before before that, uh, you know, Boba Fett was the man, the myth, the legend of few words and a few sc- on screen moments, but cool looking armor um, that people yeah. kind of build up this persona around. Um, yeah. Well, I think the extended universe comics really helped because he was a BA in them comic books. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole concept of Mandalorians is kind of built around that original look yep. for Boba Fett. Um, all right. Speaking not of Mandalorians, uh, how about we hit some Blizzard Force? Or how about Blizzard Force hits you? Yeah. <laughs> so I I'm I'm gonna um, I have not yet played Blizzard Force, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pr- just ask you guys uh, for, for if you played against it or or yeah. with it. What what are, what do you think? Give me give me some takes. Yeah, so I'll go. Uh, I played against it this past weekend, along with playing against some pikes. I have comments on all of this, um, but, but but Blizzard Force specifically, I'm going to be honest. I did not give it the respect or credit that it deserved. Um, I think, and I think we as a team here were really focused on Echo Base, right, and what Echo Base was capable of that. I don't think I really put a lot of thought into Blizzard Force. Like I saw some of the stuff. I was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Like, all right. You know, but then um, playing against it this weekend, it's just it's really, really nasty. And if you couple it with like some other nasty pieces, um, it, it can become strangely overbearing that you didn't really i didn't really think about it in that respect you know and like like the one three pip turn uh you know if you if you have both stormtroopers with the both the heavy upgrades right you could potentially give six different units to suppression so you or i'm sorry yeah six different units between the two stormtroopers so you can effectively hand out 12 suppression off of two units in one turn and for those of you that don't know how that would work you basically have your stormtrooper core unit and then you have your two heavy upgrade weapons each one can target a different unit in your attack pool giving them all and it's suppressive during that third third pip plus if you hit you've now added another suppression so it's it's pretty crazy um you know and i know that's just one turn uh but like you know the 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 one uh is it the one pip or the no it's the two pip the two pip the two jeez that thing's nasty too like mm-hmm. so basically you know you think you're safe and then you've got this weapon that comes out of nowhere that's got blast beam one uh what immune deflect and suppressive and it's what four black and surge to hit and you're just like i'm sorry what just happened like there is just some crazy combos in this um that i i didn't really fully appreciate and i know if lucas was here he'd say it was because i was spending too much time playing rebels but like i mean it's yeah until i actually played against it i i didn't realize how much of a of a impact it made on the game the uh i played three or four games of blizzard just because i'm trying a whole bunch of things right now um i was playing like veers officer four bikes two of the special storms two snows with ion and one snow with a medical droid just to make sure those storms stay healthy and Four bikes is, I mean, bikes are very fragile, but they also had HQ uplinks, which means I had full order control on them for three turns guaranteed because the barrage weapon still gives two orders. So I just give the two bikes, HQ uplink the other two, and then Imperial Discipline on the second turn to refresh HQ uplinks and get the other ones for free. And then I usually maximum firepower turn three 
and then H coupling to everything. So I'm one pipping four bikes with orders and still getting maximum firepower. So I have in the first three turns, two infinite range weapons, but actually three shots and then four bikes with four control and 11 activations. So it's a plus, I mean, the two storms that hit like trucks from range four. Yeah. It's a lot. Um, you can also make lists that are incredibly heavy hitters at range four. Like if you go the two storms and an ATSD or two, the barrage weapon, well, sorry, not the barrage weapon, the one pip, um, it like it prevents opponents from moving anything up to more one suppression when they rally, which is great. But the other amazing thing about it is it gives two orders on a one pip. So especially if you're running double ATST, you both have like yeah. targeting arrays. You give them both orders, you get names. Um, so there's a ton of things about Blizzard Force that make it just very efficient, able to just throw a lot of dice, pretty good dice from pretty long range. And or you have Vader and or you have bikes. And all that together, it's just a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's funny. I think Mike Dash said this before on the podcast, and this was something I always took to heart for a long time. And I, I think we may be in a world where this doesn't apply anymore. And and uh, But he always said, hey, you don't take the command cards for their special words. You're taking them for the pip and when you want to play the pip. And I think that is where we're 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 far from that now i think with all these like you know if you look at at mall's command cards if you look at you know din or or boba's new command cards coming out like i think you're taking them for keywords now i don't you know and it's it's getting uh interesting you know and i think i think with this with this blizzard force similar right you you're taking the the command cards are just as important part of the of the list well, I think, and I think that view was in uh, relation to when you play certain cards. Yeah, yeah. Like during a game, like you know, your pip is the. But yeah, I mean, it's it's very like all the command cards in Blizzard Force work really well, not only together, um, but also with the units that are in Blizzard Force, um, and then all of the units that are in Blizzard Force also work really well together. It's just a lot of like synergy and combos, and when I first saw these. Battle Forces, Blizzard Force was the one that stood out to me as the like the most well designed, um, like the one that felt like you actually got like a real synergy from mm. taking all the units together. You got some really good benefits from the command cards that actually applied to the units that you were taking in the force, and then you also got like this really good f- custom unit in the in the storms. Like it's clear that really Blizzard good. Force got. <laughs> a lot of TLC and like intentional uh, design focus on making sure everything worked really well together. Um, and that comes through on the table. <laughs> yep. uh, so it's hats on hats on hats. Right. Um, yeah. It's just, it's like, there's, there's no single thing that stands out to you is like, how did this become a thing? It's just everything. Like it's, it's a bunch of cogs in yeah. a machine that ends up just being really well oiled. Um so, yeah, it's interesting. I'm I'm glad that uh, at least one of the battle forces is making a splash. Um, we'll see um, if it ends up being too much of a splash. Um, I'm gonna, it's hard, I'm gonna. It's hard to tell. I just don't know because I think. Listen, I'm I'm gonna be honest with the listeners. Before we started this, I was real hot, and uh, I've since calmed down. I think it's just because I'm old and I'm getting tired, but. Um, I'm since relaxed a little bit, but I played against Pikes in in this Blizzard Force, and and hearing other people's experiences against Pikes and 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 Shadow Collective, and I just got I was getting like upset because I was like these things are all like too good, like they they're making everything else bad, and I'm I think I'm coming to a realization that maybe we're just at a we're at like this changing point. And so maybe I haven't changed yet in order to fit into this new world. Um, and maybe they're not, you know, I don't I don't want to get on here and give a hot take about how I think everything's overpowered and it's way too, too strong. But, you know, it's definitely different 
and it's definitely harder to play against in the traditional way of playing and so you know i i as we were sitting here talking i'm like maybe i just need to read like why are my brain and play in this new world that we're living in now that's that's filled with pikes and mall and blizzard force you know <laughs> i mean playing blizzard force when like if you can hold people where you want them and this is i think been true of gun lines in general over the course of the game if you can hold people where you want them you will just blast them off the table. And Blizzard Force is very good at doing that and has tools to make that even easier. That being said, it doesn't feel... Um, like, it It has some chinks in the armor that are big, and it also doesn't have... Like, I mean, you, if those storms had access to imperial guards i might be oh, losing be so my mind yeah, yeah right um and like that's why that's why i brought the medic is because those storms are actually quite fragile um because if you do three wounds to them you lose a heavy yeah um and I, the thing i also found was it was very hard to protect your heavies from train scoping Yep, because you got three models to protect instead of two. You got the two heavies plus the unit leader. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but basically, like, you have exactly as many, mo- like, I mean, even if you exclude the unit leader, um, like, when you're just sort of gunlining, you have exactly as many models to protect as you have models to protect them with. Right. Because, like, usually you'll put, like, your heavy in the middle and you can put, like, three or four guys around the heavy. Mm. Good, right? And that's pretty easy to do. But with these guys, you sort of Okay, drop the leader, put the two heavies down. Okay, I'm not gonna put one guy on either side. Um so like and in sort of just quick counterplay, like you gotta shoot those storms. <laughs> yeah, shoot them. Um yeah, they hit they hit like trucks, but they hit like trucks. Once um, you get past those first down. two models, yeah. And they don't have as much um suppression mitigation as a lot of storms are bringing in regular Empire because yep. you can't put a captain or anything on them. Right. Um, Thanks. So, yeah. yeah. No, I, yeah, I think, uh, listen, I think all this stuff, minus maybe pikes, have weaknesses uh, and chinks that you can find in the armor. Um, but I, I, it's just, you know what it is? It's, uh, it's like the first time you're up against something you've never seen before and you're just like, what is going on? It can do what? And, you know, and then you're like, you know, because we could sit here and pontificate about it and and talk all we want. But until you actually like play against it, you don't I don't for me anyways, I don't fully grasp what the capabilities of the thing are like, you know, you guys are all really good with math. So you guys have numbers usually down. But for me, I, I need like a good ass whooping before I know like what's what's actually going on uh with something and and i definitely learned my lesson this weekend um but yeah it's just interesting it's just it's an interesting time and that that beam weapon the two pip is scary Mm -hmm. um you gotta make sure you take that into into account when you're doing those reports like dude i felt really bad about doing it but i got a double train scope with that weapon (sighs) i got a heavy and a medic in one activation oh, and it was like it's one of those moments where you're like you feel bad for doing it but also like it was it was a lot like it was quote a competitive game so you gotta gotta do it yep. um but yeah <laughs> well and it's just it's a it, amongst all the various uh i guess you could call them barrage weapons um or bombardment weapons whatever you want to call them it's it's the one that has uh, the most benefits, just like printed straight on the card. Um, you know, like Leia's coordinated bombardment, she ignores cover because she has sharpshooter too. But there's nothing about the, you know that only works with Leia, right? Um, and she's got surge crit. But yeah, like this one, like you can do it on a generic officer, and the generic officer is getting the benefits that Leia would get from like coordinated bombardment because like. This has blast on it, so it doesn't matter what kind of sharpshooter the uh, the commander that's using it has, and it has surge crit on it. Um, so this is at like maximum value, whether you're using it on 
on Vader, who has, you know, neither sharpshooter nor surge crit, a generic officer who has sharpshooter one, but also no surge crit or like Veers. Well, it's, you know, it's, it sur- it's, it's surge hit on the card, not surge crit. Oh, I'm sorry. Surge, You're right. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah, sur- but, surge hit. Um, so, but the point is like, this thing is at like max value, regardless of who's using it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. It's a really good, yeah. it's a really good brush. I, I think it's, I think the fact that like, I don't know, I guess we'll see. Um, I think the fact that it's a battle force card, uh, I like that this is locked behind a battle force and not like a generic yeah. card that just exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. But yeah. yeah, I think the interesting thing too, it, it's like the combos because there's there's not just like you know with echo base i think we're arguing over like two lists right one with luke and one with leia right and and though but everything else is roughly around the same you know or little upgrade variations there's not a lot of different ways to build an echo base yeah list. i good. find yeah. this blizzard force there's a ton of different ways to build it out. And like, like ever since I got my butt whooped this weekend, I've been going through like these different iterations of it going, Oh, well they could have played this and done just as well. Or they could, uh, you could have done this or like, you know, like I was looking at like, okay, so you turn one alpha strike maximum firepower and then turn two overwhelming barrage and you just kill everything that they were hiding, like in the back like anything they were trying to hide in their backfield right like because you got four you know okay so goodbye snipers if if they don't hide them like you know there's all these things that can happen i'm just like holy moly and so yeah it's just got a ton of really good combinations that are all strong and uh although quick what i have found it's actually better to do the two pip uh barrage weapon first turn yeah and then then, then, firepower because uh one you get a one pip a little bit later in the game which is generally what you want it also often especially if you're dropping like an officer or veers to do your barrage you can like because you need to light like with beam you do need a couple things to sort of line up for it to reach maximum effectiveness so you usually want to drop like hold one of your commanders till your last drop like drop it in a place where they have like three valid targets so even if your opponent plays a one pip and moves something out of the way you still can like beam into two things yeah um and fair. then ma- and then maximum firepower because the only it is a one pip so if you just need to go with it right away you're more likely to be able to do that and also because it's only one target it's easier to line up like it's easier to line up one thing than two things of course so yeah no that's fair i was you know i was just yeah. thinking but um yeah, because that turn, yeah, it's just, it's wild. There's just so many different things in, in those stormtroopers. God, <laughs> golly, three it's, red, three white at range four. It's crazy how low their cost is for you. Yeah. Take two of these. That, the, my, my one bugaboo with uh, Blizzard is those storms could probably go up. Yeah. A f- a, at least a handful of points, and they'd be fine. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to spoil too much because Lucas is writing an article on this. Which will be out this week, um, but uh, he basically did a statistical analysis using all of the data from Legion stats, which is all of the tournaments that are in TTO, basically, um, looking at like unit win chances and how they affect your win chance. Um, and a Blizzard Force unit. I will let you guess which one um, had the single highest win rate of any unit. <laughs> <laughs> um since the battle forces were released so the, um, the graphs in that article are so pretty they really are uh <laughs> i'm very excited for it um well he's using sure. that phd it's good <laughs> yeah we'll have plenty to talk about uh, with that next week but slight teaser there um the top the top win percent unit is a blizzard force unit <laughs> i'll say that much a unit that is available in blizzard force so um that's wild but so. but i mean remember how much spiders were hurting things at range four with three black three white yeah well, let's just make that three, three red, red three white and they usually have an aim because because they don't it, that doesn't exhaust like a spider's ion weapon does yeah 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 it's 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 a it 
in a lot of ways that are, I mean, good and bad, depending on your perspective, they act a lot like spiders. Mm. Yeah, and um, if you happen to get to range three, that's three three more dice on top of that. <laughs> yeah, the the odd time it was like, yep, yeah, we'll just oh, you're at range three already, great. Three yeah. red, six white. <laughs> yeah. It's real good. Um, we're talking specifically, by the way, there about the RTC and DLT combo. I was yeah. just going to say that same thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Those are the two which, weapons. Which yeah. is, I, I believe, the one has you been want. quickly found. Yeah. Any other combo is leaving leaving money on the table there. Yep. Agreed. All right. Uh, you, could, you could put in the HH12. Uh, <laughs> no. No, please don't do that. Like, let, the, I mean... The other, the only other combo that I could think of an argument for would be the T twenty one and RTC. Yeah, but at that point, you might as well just play a regular yeah. captain. Like you might as well play a regular Empire list and get a captain T twenty one because it's basically the same thing. Well, T twenty one is kind of a waste when you have so many dice. Um, I know that sounds weird on a gun with critical, but since they already surged to hit, like at some point you're just mostly going to be, unless you're shooting into armor, you're mostly just going to be counting paint. Um, and, uh, you know, especially when you can get that double heavy range floor, four pool, it seems silly to leave that on the table. But, but uh, I, I mean, especially like, so if, if you take the RTC and the T21, your range three pool is 11 dice, one red, 10 white. But with a captain T21, you're nine white dice. So, like, if that's what your goal is, you might as well just take a Captain T21 in a regular Empire squad. Yep. Hmm. Or specialist or whatever. Yeah. Or, yeah, Compel whatever. Or something already. Yeah. Whatever combos. But, yep. Yeah. All right. Do you guys have any, have any final thoughts? Oh, we're at the end. I, yeah, I, th- I, think we can, I think we can table our... Uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we talked a little bit about random other lists so yeah this, this is a little bit how to find lists just right. think about them random <laughs> final thoughts yeah all right you know what now i'm gonna give you a hot take on the way out for those of you that stuck all the way to the back ban pikes <laughs> ban them no i think here's the problem with pikes two things i think uh they need to go up in costs and i think they need to get pulled out of like two factions and then I think they'd be reasonable. Um, that's that's where I'm at. <laughs> I don't. I think it's. I think also people are. I, I shouldn't say people are sleeping on Black Suns a little bit because that was kind of the theme of Gen Con was all the Black Suns that were yeah. in the top eight. Um, so yeah, it's no. Yeah, listen, uh, Jeremy, who I'm not, I've mentioned, dis- I'm not disagreeing with you. Let's put it right. that way. Our buddy Jeremy, who's part of the Fifth Trooper, he he won the tournament this weekend with Black Suns and Vader. Um, they're really good, but you know, Tim had said, uh, in our pre show that you, you, you know, you kill a couple of black sons and they, they lose their luster. They're not as great as they were. Uh, good luck killing pikes. Good <laughs> luck. Lots of high velocity. Well, and I'm, I'm Even talking then, like more than the standard three snipers. You need like, yeah. like extra high yeah. velocity. Yeah, <sighs> which is but but the problem is if you're designing your list just it's it's just it's so they need a points increase and they need to get pulled out of at least two, if not three factions. I mean if if they were like I mean this is not gonna happen, but if they went up twenty points, you wouldn't care if they were in four factions. <laughs> no, I'd still care. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that we will be able to have this discussion uh, in a more informed way next week. Uh, let's put it that way. Yeah, my my sad thing about this is the list I actually want to play are going to get hurt by all the anti pike tech. <laughs> yeah, like clones get hurt by all the anti pike tech because what's yeah. anti pike tech? You want to ignore dodge tokens, and most things that do that also have pierce at long range, which are all the things that clones hate. So yeah. And yeah, Jedi. clones are like a clones and Jedi are like a side casualty of people talking against spikes. Yeah, <laughs> but, but like and, rebel DLTs, which I mean I don't think eh, some people will be care about that. But, whatever. It won't yeah. affect clones that much because they don't get any play. <laughs> well that's true also. <laughs> so, <it'll, laughs> they're already losing, so who cares? Yeah. Yeah. Um <laughs> how could you lose anymore? 
right. when they um, do the points update there's going to be a clones po- points hike <laughs> we're going to be able to talk more. about this next week unless next right. week's going to be a long episode um all right uh well let's let's land this thing um we're the notorious scholars i'm kyle i'm jay band pikes shalansky i'm timbo Stay fresh, cheese bags. <laughs>